Good morning, Four Mile Church. It's great to be able to worship with you, especially after this challenging week that this public health situation has created for all of us. Just know that we're all working together through this thing. We're going to stay together, united in prayer, and we're going to glorify Lord, the Lord through it all. So I think if there's one thing we've learned this week is that this public health situation, it's here to stay for the foreseeable future. It's when they say the new normal, I think that's what we're looking at here. And so we just got to get better as a church at how we improve our online worship experience, as well as improve the safety for whatever we worship in person. And so I'm excited about many of the innovations that Tyler and the tech team have been working on uh, to improve that online experience. And similarly, we're going to be putting some new procedures in to make it just a little bit safer whenever we join together in person to worship. So we're super excited about all of that. And of course, we always want you to be able to worship however you feel most comfortable. So if you want to wear a mask or if you don't want to wear a mask or if you want to be vaccinated or unvaccinated or online or in person, whichever, we just want to be there to support you and your family however we possibly can. Now, similarly, each week, we're all about this football and the fundamentals. And so we always remind ourselves of the importance of those foundational fundamentals because they're perishable skills. And that's why teams gather to practice every single day. One of those foundational fundamentals in football is ball security. And so coaches go over this again and again in practice about the five points of contact, the fingertips, the palm, the forearm, the bicep, and the chest. And all five of those points work together to secure that football. And it's so important to stay focused on this because it's one of those skills that we can kind of get a little sloppy with. And when we get sloppy, that's when the, we do fumbles. And if you fumble the ball a lot in football, you're not going to have a lot of success. Well, similarly, Jesus is going to teach us today about one of those foundational fundamentals of our faith, and that's prayer. And although many of us have been praying for years, I think we're going to see today just how sloppy that we can get in those fundamentals. And just like everything else in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus turns our world upside down and shows us how he actually wants us to pray. In particular, and Cami watched the series last week, he's focused on the intention behind those actions. And so he gives us three examples to illustrate what he means when he says, beware of practicing your righteous acts in front of other people so that they can see it. Because you remember, throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is always focused on those intentions behind those external actions. And so it's not a problem to do good things in front of people, but we shouldn't be doing them so that other people see that, so that we get some kind of credit for it. And that's what Jesus is focused on in this particular case. So I want to just apologize up front that this is going to be a little mechanical today. Um, I'm obviously recording this at home on my iPhone. Um, Cammie's recording her portions at home as well. And then we're sending it off to Tyler, and he's got to put it together. And we can only do this in so uh, in small little chunks. And so um, it's going to be feel a little choppy. I'm already pretty mechanical to begin with, as you guys know. And so I apologize up front for that, but just bear with us. So I'm going to kick this over to Cammie, and she's going to go ahead and open us up in prayer and read the scripture for us. And then we'll, I'll come back in, and we'll go ahead and unpack this together. Church. It is good to be with you today, even though it has to be over a screen. No matter where you are, I invite you right now to bow your heads and pray with me. Father in heaven, on this day that you have made, we choose to rejoice. On this day, as in every day past and in every day to come, you are worthy of our praise and adoration. You are worthy of our trust. God, we thank you that you have been faithful. We thank you that you have provided for all of our needs and you have kept your promises to us in Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that has been made possible for us in Jesus. And we thank you for the new every morning mercy and grace that is freely ours if we would but receive it from your generous hand. We know, Lord, that you know every one of our requests before we ever speak them. But thank you for inviting us to enjoy the profound intimacy and accessibility that we have with you in prayer. This morning, Lords, Lord, our hearts are heavy with the brokenness of this world and the brokenness of our bodies. Indeed, they are daily reminders of how very much we need and long for your restoration of all things. For all those from our church who are sick in any way, God, we pray for your gracious hand to hold them fast. 
We ask that you would bring peace and comfort as only you can. And Lord, we boldly ask for healing to come to each one of them, healing that will glorify your great name and that would draw each of them closer to your heart. God, we pray for our staff and elders that you would give us wisdom and discernment as we make decisions and navigate the way forward. Let them be for the good of your people and the furthering of your kingdom come. Father, today we also want to thank you for those who have served our country in the armed forces. We thank you for their courage, their sacrifice, their love for this great land and for those they swore to protect and defend. We ask that you bless them and their families and for all those who continue to serve, God, we pray that you would surround them with your strength and protection. It is so incredible to know that even though we are not meeting in person today, we are still united in spirit, truth, and love. Thank you that you are still with us, every single one of us. And even though we aren't lifting our voices together in song this morning, may our hearts burst with praise for you. As David now preaches, we ask that your spirit would illuminate your word. Give us understanding, God. Pierce our hearts and change us. In Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. I'm going to be looking at uh, my screen so I won't be looking in the camera. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who was in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. So I think we can all agree that prayer is one of those foundational fundamentals of our faith. And just like we learned last week from Cami, we can get a little sloppy with giving. Well, similarly, we can get a little sloppy with the way we do our prayers. And we see that the word Jesus uses to describe it is hypocrites. And as we learned last week, that means pretender, or it means actor. And so how is it that we're pretending or we're acting? Well, we're praying with wrong motives or wrong intentions. And so we, sometimes we come off as these high and mighty prayer warriors but we have to guard against it being one big sham job because sometimes we can find ourselves praying for show or we're praying just droning on with too many words, especially in public settings. We've all been to that dinner or that church event where someone's got to bless the food before we can eat. Good Presbyterians, we don't eat until somebody prays. And so we usually look around for someone who's suitable to do such an esteemed petition for us on our behalf for our food. And of course, they know they've been selected too, and so sometimes they start getting a little showy by using those fancy words, or they slide in their opinion on things so that you learn a little bit more about them, and the prayer becomes focused on them. And of course, this is exactly what Jesus is warning us against, because we don't want to be praying and worrying about what other people perceive us. We want to be praying to God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. So maybe you're just sitting there like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know those people, I've been there, but that's not me. I don't pray in public. I don't even like speaking in public. Okay, great. But then maybe you're one of those people who tells other people that you're praying for them all the time. Now think about that. Why do we do that? There must be some reason we want them to know that we're praying for them. 
Now, it could certainly be the case that we want to encourage them, let them know that we're standing alongside them. But there's also the possibility that we're looking for a little credit out of it. After all, it's kind of us to take time out of our busy schedules to intercede on their behalf. And maybe if things work out, perhaps they'll attribute some of that to me. And so I'll get some glory for it. And of course, as busy as we all are, there's also a good chance that we'll just forget to pray for them altogether. We've all done that before. That just shows us how the motive behind when we told them we would pray for them was really all about us because we just forgot. It just wasn't important enough for us to even remember to pray for them. You know, we're busy people, we have busy lives. Or perhaps we just pause amidst a hurried moment at the coffee shop to offer up a quick one, to cover our bases. Dear God, please be with Kim. Sure hope she feels better soon. Oh, I'm up next. I'll take a half calf, half soy, double ristretto, caramel macchiato, extra hot, extra whip, non-fat, sugar-free, upside down, double cup, no sleeve. Not bad, especially for a guy who doesn't even drink coffee. Um, had to have someone help me with that one. In fact, I'm terrified of going into coffee shops. Isn't that intimidating? But do you see how we can put so much more thought and effort behind our coffee order than we do praying for other people? Do you see how we're guilty of getting sloppy and turning that whole thing into one big sham? All because, even if it's only a hint, we seek worldly credit using prayer as a false pretense. So that's the first thing that Jesus wants us to learn from this passage today. So what are we supposed to do about it? Well, he tells us two things. Pray in secret and don't babble. So first, pray in secret. Jesus teaches, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. In other words, remove all possibility of praying in a way that might bring you glory and pray in a way that brings God glory. It puts us right back to where this whole Sermon on the Mount began with the Beatitudes, which were a call to humility. Notice specifically, he says, go to your room, that place where you can most be yourself, where there's no pretense, where you aren't worried what other people think about you or judging you by what you wear or what you're saying. It's just you, all alone, the way God created you to be. Oh, and shut the door too. Make sure there are no outside distractions, no chance anyone could hear or even know what you're doing up there in your room. Now, of course, back then, most rooms or most houses only had one room. So Jesus is speaking figuratively again. He's speaking about our hearts. It's there in the private corner of our hearts that we approach God. We approach him in his throne. And it's there that we converse with him as only we can with our Heavenly Father. Why? Because it says right there, our Father is in secret. He operates in that secret place. He's the only other one that can meet us there. And that's why it's such a comfort in many ways that we have a relationship with God. But at the same time, it should also trouble us a little bit because of all that we have going on inside of our hearts some days. So once again, Jesus is showing us how important it is that we understand who God is and who we are, which is why we come back to this graphic yet again. And I know it probably looks a little bit weird on this particular setup, but um, you've seen it before many times. You know this is the beginning and the basis of it all. And we have to always remind ourselves because, you see, we live in his presence. He knows the very intention behind every action, including all of our prayers. And even though prayer is a really good thing to be doing, it's also something we can see right now how easily we get sloppy with it and we can turn it into something bad. So prayer isn't something we need to enter into flippantly because we're going into conversation with the creator and sustainer of the universe when we pray. And he is perfectly holy and the author of truth. So we can't be coming at him with our hypocritical sham prayers. No, our prayers, 
need to be more like this image. And you've all seen this before too. It's a great reminder of humility. God tells us, this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. This is the image we need to have in our hearts when we go before our Father to pray, never seeking any attention or credit for ourselves, but rather coming before him in the secret of our hearts with no pretense, genuine, humble, contrite, and with hearts that tremble at his word. And next Jesus teaches, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, as if somehow God will hear us because of the many words that we use. In other words, don't babble. So we've moved from hypocrites to Gentiles, basically anyone who wasn't Jewish or part of the nation Israel. The Gentile pagan customs of the day employed mechanical, verbose sort of ritual babble to arouse the attention of their gods. Take, for example, this wonderful story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. It's one of the greatest showdowns in all scripture. It's Elijah, the prophet of God, against the Gentile prophets of the Baal to see who can call down fire on a sacrifice bull. The prophets of Baal, they go first. They babble on and on from the beginning of the day all the way till midday, just pouring all kinds of babble at them, all sorts of ritualistic prayers over and over again for hours. And at midday, still no fire. And then Elijah steps up and he orders four jars of water poured on top of the bowl and the wood and everything there that's part of the sacrifice. And then he says, do it three times over. And then there's water throughout the entire trench, soaked completely. He prays to God. And this is his prayer. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord came down, consuming the bull, the wood, the stones, and licking up all the water in that trench. And we see efficacious prayers like this over and over throughout scripture. We've all got to learn to pray just like this. No babble, clear, concise, lucid expressions coming from a place of humility, all for God's glory alone. And then we see the fire come down with a fury and not just consuming the bull, but everything around it. And that's how we each have to learn how to pray. So don't babble. Oh Lord, thanks for such a wonderful day. Such great weather. Lots going on today, you know. Please help me have a good day. I sure do like the sunshine. We recently have been having a lot of rain. So thanks again for not giving us rain again today. I have a lot to do outside, you know. Oh, and be with Kim. Sure hope she feels better soon. Amen. What is that? I mean, what are we thinking like that, right? And you say to yourself, oh, I'm just talking with my good old buddy, God. You know, he's my friend. We just chat anytime we want. He's like my little genie in a bottle. Throw some words or thoughts his way. Who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky. Now, obviously, I'm going a little over the top on this one, but maybe not so much, especially with regard to that genie part, as though all we need to do is rub God with a little prayer, and whenever we're in a pinch, he'll be there to help us out. But here's the thing. Are we more focused on getting what we want from God, or are we more focused on asking God for whatever it is he wants out of our lives? How many times have we been a part of prayers that just drone on and on? How many times have we in our prayers just droned on and on? You know, the longest prayer in the Bible is only three minutes. It's Jesus' farewell prayer before he goes to the cross to die. Now, I'm not suggesting that prayer should only be three minutes in length because we know Jesus went off for extended periods of time to pray. But perhaps three minutes is a reasonable metric for us to set with ourselves if we're going on and on about a particular matter. 
just like those Gentile pagan prophets of Baal were doing? If so, we shouldn't expect any fire either. So Jesus teaches us here, don't babble when you pray. And then we get this next line, which I believe is a true game changer when it comes to prayer. Jesus tells us specifically why we're not to babble. He says, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Not only is God always present and holy and the author of truth, but he is also all-knowing. So we really don't need to inform God about what's going on in our lives. We've been having a lot of rain, God. Seriously, how many times have we been a part of prayers where we are telling God what's going on in our lives? He knows all about the rain. He made it. He even sent it. So do you see how sloppy we can get with those fundamentals? Now notice what he says here also. He knows what you need, which is often much different than what we want, which is typically what we're praying for, our wants, not our needs. And that brings us to this foundational truth that we see here in this part of Scripture. That prayer, at its very essence, is all about our complete and utter dependence on God for absolutely everything that we need. He knows what we need even before we ask him. Now, you may conclude, why then do we even need to pray? Well, you see, the asking is all about the dependence. That dependence piece is so important because it speaks to that humility which is the underlying foundation of everything in God's kingdom. That little shadow of a guy up here, that's us. We are fully dependent on God for absolutely everything that we need. He is the creator, and the creator sustains everything that he created. He wants us to pray, even though he already knows what we need, but he doesn't want sloppy prayers in his kingdom. So we are simply not to seek any credit or attention in our prayers by babbling and droning on in them. When we do that, we are attempting to glorify ourself. Those wordy, impressive, flashy prayers going on and on and on. We get all the credit we deserve as people think to them, well, oh, that's quite a prayer warrior over there. But what God's calling us to do is pray for his glory. And when we do that, when we humble ourselves before his presence in the quiet secret of our hearts, not to drone on with thoughtless words, but to express our absolute and utter dependence on God for meeting every single one of our needs, seeking to glorify his great name by operating in humility as heirs of his kingdom, desiring to do his will, not our will. So let's be about the business this week of cleaning up our sloppy prayers. Let's get after one of these foundational fundamentals of our faith, because there's absolutely no higher reward than glorifying God with how we pray. We're going to see all about this next week, particularly as we dive into the Lord's Prayer. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, you created us, you sustain us. And you know exactly what we need. You also know the intentions of our hearts. And we long for hearts that will come before you in humility. Lord, forgive us for seeking our own glory and our attempts at righteousness through our giving and through our prayers. We are utterly dependent upon you for all that we have, even the next breath that we take. So we want to give you all the glory. We ask for help in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So no doubt praying is a challenge. It's something we're going to continue to work on. I really hope you come back next week. Uh, we're going to have a chance to tear apart the Lord's Prayer. And I trust you just like everything else in the Sermon on the Mount. It's really going to help you. It's going to change the way you approach prayer. So hope to see you on our Zoom call at 11 o'clock. And for the rest of this week, we really hope you stay well.
yeah, just a couple announcements uh, before we sign off. I've got them written down so I don't forget anything. Next Sunday, which is November 21st at 3 p.m., we're meeting down at Shaw Park, which is that little pavilion right beside Beaver High School. And we're going to be praying not just for the students at Beaver High School, but for the students in Beaver County. So we would love for you to join us for that prayer walk. Um, obviously, the Covenant Partner class for today has been postponed. If you signed up for that, we will definitely be sure to let you know when we're going to have the next one. And if you weren't able to come to this one, that works out, doesn't it? So again, we'll keep you all posted and let you know when the next one is going to be. Um, if you're a covenant partner and you have not downloaded the app yet and updated the directory, we want you to do that before the end of this month. So please do that as soon as you can. Um, when we're able and when it's safe, we'll be sure to continue to have people available to help you troubleshoot, troubleshoot and get it set up. Uh, on November 28th, that is the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. And we're going to do a little something different this year. We're going to have some outdoor services every Sunday leading up to Christmas Eve at 5 p.m. Those are in addition to our Sunday morning services. But um, we're going to meet outside. We'll have a real simple meal. It'll be a short service. But we just thought it would be a fun way to celebrate Advent in a little bit of a different way. So again, that starts Sunday, November 20. And last, uh, at this point in time, we're still moving forward with the drop-in shop on Friday, December 3rd. So those are for families with um, youngsters so that they can, you know, get some Christmas shopping done, enjoy some time together. So if you want more information on that, just go ahead on, on over to our website, 4mile.org, or you can email Courtney at 4mile.org. 4 mile so, um, hey, I really hope that you join us at 11 o'clock on our Zoom call. We can't wait to see you and pray together and all that good stuff. So thanks for joining us today. Have a good one, church.